All right, so we just said that electron configuration, this refers to which orbitals have electrons and how many electrons are in each one of those orbitals. Okay, so we've got another diagram of our atom here. We've got the nucleus in the center, got our blue electron rings, and these electron rings are grouped into energy level one and energy level two. What I left out here in this diagram was our green rectangular orbitals. So what I want you guys to do here is take a second, fill out the green rectangular orbitals that we had in our last diagram, show me how many orbitals should be in each one of these electron rings and what type they are. Are they S or P? Okay, so go ahead and uh, take a second and do that. Fill out the orbitals, just those green empty boxes. Then we're gonna come back and talk about which of those orbitals have electrons in them and how many electrons are gonna be in each one of those orbitals, okay? All right, so hopefully you guys got something similar to this. First electron ring of an energy level gets one orbital and it's an S orbital. Same thing down here. First electron ring of an energy level gets one orbital, it's an S orbital. It's not until you get to the second electron ring of an energy level that you get one, two, three orbitals and those are gonna be P orbitals, okay? So we're talking about electron configuration. We wanna know which of these orbitals has electrons in it and how many electrons are in each one of those orbitals. But before we can talk about that, we need to know which atom we're talking about. Okay, so different atoms are gonna have different numbers of electrons. Okay, so all those atoms on the periodic table that you see, those all have different numbers of electrons. Take for example, carbon. Carbon is number six on the periodic table, so it's gonna have six electrons. Nitrogen is number seven on the periodic table, so it's gonna have seven electrons. Oxygen is number eight, so it's gonna have eight electrons, and so on. Okay, so depending on what atom you're talking about, this diagram is gonna look different because each atom has a different number of electrons. Okay, so let's take for example carbon. We said that carbon is number six on the periodic table, so it's gonna have six electrons. So if we wanted to know which orbitals have electrons and how many electrons are in each, if we were talking about a carbon atom, then there's a bunch of different ways we can arrange the six electrons that carbon has. Okay, so we could choose to put maybe all six electrons in this one orbital and none in the rest, or maybe we could do two in this one and four in this one and none in those, or maybe two here, two here, one here, one here, and no here. Okay, so there's a bunch of different ways you can configure these electrons in these electron rings and these orbitals. But you should know from GCHEM that there really is only one way that we configure this and it's called the ground state configuration. Okay, so let's go and write some of this stuff down. All right, so we're saying that we can place electrons in many different configurations in these orbitals. Okay, so if we were talking about carbon, carbon has six electrons. You could put, for example, six electrons in this one orbital and none in the rest, or you could put two here, two here, two here, and none in those, or one here, one here, one here, and then three here, and then none in that one. Point is, there's a bunch of different configurations that are possible, but, we're only gonna use the ground state configuration because that's the one where electrons are in their most stable configuration. And this is a very common theme in chemistry, you guys. Things are always going to favor stability over instability. You're always gonna go from something unstable to something that's more stable, okay? So take, for example, a marker, okay? So take a marker, stick it in your hand. Is this marker more stable standing up or lying down? Obviously lying down, right? You guys, it takes a lot of balance for this thing to stand up on its own. So this marker goes from something that's unstable to something that's stable. Stability is favored over instability, okay? All right, so this is actually a very simple concept, but it's super important to OCHEM. So I wanna take a break here for a second to make sure you have this down. Okay, so we're saying that stability is favored over instability. But what's another way of saying this? Well, remember, stability and energy are inversely related. Okay, so something that's high in energy is gonna be low in stability. 
Okay, so take for example a nuclear reactor that's going into meltdown because of an overload of energy. Okay, so that nuclear reactor is super high in energy. Would you think that that nuclear reactor that's going into meltdown is going to be high in stability or low in stability? That nuclear reactor is going to be very low in stability. Okay, so something that's high in energy is low in stability. And the third piece to this puzzle is that something that's low in stability is going to be high in reactivity. Okay, so something that's high in energy, low in stability, and high in reactivity. And that all makes sense, right, you guys? Because a nuclear reactor that's going to melt down is high in energy, and it's so high in energy, you expect it to be high in reactivity. It's going to react, it's going to explode, and something that's high in reactivity is going to be low in stability, okay? So whenever you think of this relationship, I want you to think of something high in energy, like a nuclear reactor, and think, hey, that nuclear reactor is going to be low in stability and high in reactivity, okay? And on the flip side to this story, we can talk about something that's low in energy, high in stability, and low in reactivity. Okay, so take for example my cat. My cat's about 15 years old now. Uh, she's gotten kind of fat, uh, she's pretty lazy, and she's pretty low in energy, I'd say. Okay, so she's pretty low in energy, so that's made her have a pretty stable lifestyle. So she spends most of the time just lying around the house, you know, taking naps, you know, occasionally she'll go to the kitchen, get a snack. Um, but she's pretty low in energy compared to what she used to be when she was younger. You know, now she's not chasing around birds around the house or running around. She's pretty much just sleeping around the house. Okay, so my cat, she's fat, she's lazy, she's low in energy. She's low in energy, which makes her high in stability. And since she's high in stability, she's not likely to react. Even if she saw a bird about five feet away from her, she's less likely to react because she doesn't have the energy. Okay, so let's just say this one more time. Something that's high in energy, like a nuclear reactor, is going to be low in stability and it's more likely to react, it's high in reactivity. Versus something that's low in energy, like my old fat cat, she's low in energy, she's going to be high in stability and less likely to react. Okay, so let me go ahead and write this down for you. All right, so go ahead and write this down on a separate piece of paper because it doesn't belong in your notes here. This is just a general concept that I really want you guys to know for OCHEM because this is the reason why all reactions happen. Things that are high in energy, the reason why they're so reactive is because they want to react to become something that's low in energy. Same thing for stability. Things that are unstable, they're reactive because they want to react to become something that's more stable. Okay, so if you ever have trouble remembering this relationship, just remember a nuclear reactor, this thing is super high in energy, making it low in stability, making it super reactive, this thing wants to explode, right? Versus an old cat, right? My old cat, she's low in energy, which makes her high in stability, she just naps and eats all the time, and that makes her have very low reactivity, okay? So we're gonna be doing reactions all year long, and you're gonna be thinking to yourself, man, why did that happen? And most likely the reason is because you want us to go from something that's high in energy to something that's low in energy, from something that's unstable to something stable, okay? So go ahead and get this down and uh, we'll go ahead and get back to electron configuration. All right, so getting back to electron configuration, we were saying that there's many different types of configurations that these electrons can be in, but we only care about the ground state configuration because that's where electrons are in their most stable state. That's the positions that those electrons are most likely to be in because stability is always favored over instability, okay? Okay, so it's common sense that we want electrons in their most stable state, but how do we know what that is? Well, we've got three rules for how to get electrons in their most stable configuration. Let's write this down.
All right, so we have these three rules to help us draw electrons in their ground state configuration, their most stable configuration. Because the idea is that your instructor can ask you, hey, draw the structure of a carbon atom, for example. Okay, so he's gonna want you to draw the generic structure of an atom like we've done here with the nucleus, the electron rings, and the orbitals. And then he's gonna want you to know that, hey, carbon, that's atom number six on the periodic table, so it should have six electrons. Okay, so he's gonna want you to draw out the generic structure of the atom like we've done here, and then also be able to tell where those six electrons are gonna go. Are they gonna go in this orbital, this orbital, this orbital? Where are those electrons gonna go? These three rules are gonna be our guide for how to do that. So let's go through these. All right, so our first rule says to fill orbitals in increasing energy. So remember, the closer you are to the nucleus, the lower in energy you are. The further away you get from the nucleus, the higher in energy you are. Okay, so this electron ring that's the closest to the nucleus, this is the lowest in energy. Compared to this electron ring that's the furthest away from the nucleus, this is going to be the highest in energy, right? So when this says to fill orbitals in increasing energy, then this means that you don't want to put an electron in this orbital first because this electron ring is the highest in energy, which means the lowest in stability. So we're looking for electrons in their most stable positions. So we'd want to put an electron in the lowest energy place, like this first electron ring in this orbital, okay? Because that's going to be the lowest in energy and the most stable, okay? So that's what this means, fill orbitals in increasing energy. And this is exactly like climbing a flight of stairs. You can't automatically start out at the top of the stairs. You got to start out at the bottom and then work your way up. Same thing with here. You gotta start out at the bottom step and then work your way to the next step and then work your way to the top, okay? So that's our first rule. All right, so our second rule is pretty self-explanatory. You're only gonna give one electron at a time. Okay, so if you're trying to figure out where the six electrons for carbon goes, you're not just gonna dump all six electrons to this orbital at one time. You only give out one electron at a time. And our third and last rule is two electrons per orbital with opposite spins. Okay, so each one of these orbitals can only hold two electrons and they're gonna have opposite spins. And this is just like Shoes in a shoebox, you guys. You've got two shoes to a shoebox and they're facing opposite directions because that's the most stable orientation for these guys to be in, right? So same thing for electrons. In these orbitals, let me draw an orbital for you here. So you've got a green rectangular box that stands for an orbital. And then if you put electrons in here, this stands for one electron. This stands for a second electron. So you can have a maximum of two electrons per orbital and they're facing opposite directions. Okay, so this is the third rule. Two electrons go in an orbital and they're gonna have opposite spins.